Hello and welcome to another deprogrammed interview. My name is Carrie Smith. I'm very excited about my guest today. He is a comedian and cultural commentator. His name's Owen Benjamin. Many of you are probably already familiar with him, but in case you're not, I'm going to let him tell you a little bit about himself. Please welcome Owen. Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm so excited to talk with you. I feel like I'm having one of those parasocial moments because I, uh, when you were on YouTube, we can get into what happened to you at YouTube, but I used to watch you all the time. So I feel like I know you, but you don't know me. <laughs> I, I love that. I love that beginning cartoon you play. I used to play that uh, to people. And the funny part, the funniest part was uh, their little songs like that. Want to be a member? Want to be a member? And I, we used to, oh. that was it. That was a Betty theme Boop? for a while. What's that? Betty Boop? Yeah, there was this whole thing about want to be a member. And uh, when I was, uh, we, me and my audience, because my audience, a lot of my audience is very interactive with what I make. Like they yes. make cartoons, they make sketches, they this. make music. Yeah, and we have uh, meetups and we have all this stuff. And, uh, and that was one of our themes for a while. It was so funny that you played that. I, I can't remember if it was that exact cartoon. I think that one was... Uh, but but that just reminded me of that about the want to be a member guys. They, they, want, the, they always wanted to be part of the club. It's hilarious. The Betty Boop cartoons, a lot of them are in the public domain now because of some crazy legal stuff. So you can use any of the Betty Boop stuff, and That's a lot awesome. of it's really cool. That one's an episode where uh, Bilbo Bilbo, I think is his name, the character Bimbo. Joins a, Bimbo. He joins a cult. Yeah, yeah. Bimbo falls <laughs> underground. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and it's so funny. I wanted to talk to you about that, too. We can talk about anything you want, but uh, that, like how, how all of society is almost like a giant cult. It's like, uh, it's funny, people that have been in cults, and I just see like the rituals that, that the mainstream are doing, and I, I just think there's a lot of crossover to, to cult behavior, you know? Uh, I, I do, too. I watch a lot of cult documentaries because, well... I was in social justice. You saw uh, my clip with uh, Peter Rogozi, and that's how we got connected. Yeah, it was um, a great clip. Thank you. I, uh, I, when I was coming out of social justice, it was a long process. It took me uh, over a year. And in some ways, it's very cult-like. I talk about it in that respect. And there are a lot of similarities. So stuff like the Heaven's Gate documentaries, things like that, I find them really interesting. The, here yeah, in Texas, yeah. Waco thing. Um and just the way that people can kind of see it's easier when, when it, when it's got, when there's like a charismatic leader, when there's like a Jim Jones or someone, everybody's like, Oh, that's obviously a cult. They all live in the same place. There's this one leader who's, who's in charge. Um, it's, I think it's harder for people to see what you're talking about where things are cult like, but they're, you don't all live together and yeah, there's yeah, not exactly. like one leader, you know? And so yeah. they're like, what do you mean? That's a cult. It's just a belief system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So I want to, like I said, I think a lot of people who watch the program are already familiar with you, but I do also have a lot of new people who aren't online very much. Um, and so uh, like people from, I'm thinking like my church community and stuff. Could you just tell people a little bit about sure. who you are? Yeah. I, uh, I was a stand-up comedian in LA for 16 years and I, well, I'm from a small town in uh, Northern New York near Canada. And my dad taught rhetoric and public speech so that's where I got those skills from and then my mom taught children's literature until she uh quit to be a full-time mom and uh so that archetype the very simple archetype of children's lit and then my dad's ability to uh articulate in public and then I was a classical piano player so it I, I didn't realize it at the time but those skill sets were all coming together for uh to be in entertainment you know and and being from a very impoverished small town, I could communicate very well to uh, a wide amount of people, you know, like, because a lot of that type of erudite professor background, like my dad went to Oxford, you know, and so wow. they don't know how to communicate very well. And me and my dad don't currently like get along great. I'm not saying he's like a great guy, but the skill set is, is there. Mm -hmm. And so when I went out to Los Angeles with my childhood friend, uh, who wanted to be a screenwriter. And I just graduated college with a degree in history. And I just didn't know what to do with my life. I didn't really want to be a lawyer. That was kind of like where my path was going. And mm -hmm. a family friend had me intern with him, like just showed me around. I think he was trying to save me. You know, he was like, he was like, look at basically look at how bad this is. And so I was like, okay, 
so I'm going to go with my buddy and we're just, I, I got a job bussing tables. We we're 22. I worked as a janitor in a hotel and I started doing stand up. And then Adam Sandler saw me do stand up. I, I was really good at it. I mean, I would bomb sometimes, but overall I was, I was good at it. And so he put me in, um, Chuck and Larry in the House Bunny. I was the butler of the Playboy Mansion of the movie The House Bunny with Anna yep. Ferris. And I was like 25 at that point. I was already on the show Punked, where uh, where I was one of the uh, the guys that would set up a celebrity and we would make fun of them and all that. And so, and that all just came. It wasn't from family connections or anything like that or uh, anything. It was just because I was really good at stand up and I could stay in the moment. Like I wasn't scripted. And so, uh, you know, way led, led on to way. And I got on uh, a sitcom. I was a regular on a sitcom. I was a regular on Leno and Fallon. And I toured with Vince Vaughn on the Wild West Comedy Show and all that stuff. And so then can uh, I, can I so, interject here for a second? Yeah. You you are a really great stand up. Uh, we were just rewatching some of your clips. And I have to tell you. Your Titanic bit is so funny. I can just think about it and laugh. <laughs> and my husband, I was like, when I first, like a year or so ago, I was showing him some of your stuff. And he he had never watched the movie Titanic. So we had to go watch it. It was his first time seeing that movie just so he could really appreciate the jokes. But you bring you bring the keyboard in. You bring your piano background into, into comedy. And you do, I think it it works really well. So. Yeah, and I used to do the bit about, uh, I'll just really quickly, just the one about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the Timberland. Eh, eh, eh. So I, one of my big uh, bits from years ago was, uh, you know, Timberland producing Beethoven, and I'd play these long <laughs> Beethoven songs and just be like, eh. And then the after that, the bit was, and Beethoven was deaf. He still would have been like, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> And so it's funny, and and uh, and when I was being like, uh, you know, blackballed, and I'm this horrible man. One of the one of the uh, uh, storylines about me is how racist I am. And the funniest part is I've recently become friends with uh, Ye, the artist formerly known as Kanye West, and he loves all that shit because it's so true. It's like, <laughs> so in the music world, they really will just put something over something else. And call it a new song. Yes, and it was and it was funny because Dave Chappelle uh, used a bunch of my jokes. Like I was the. Uh, let me finish the story, and then I'll get into some. Yeah, funny yeah, stuff. yeah. Okay, okay. So, so you yeah, so twenty sixteen. Yeah, twenty sixteen right. is when things really took a turn in my life because I had a a child, and I got married, and uh, I started looking more long term. You know, before that, it wasn't like I was a bad person. I was just very short sighted and very selfish and very carrot and stick like what's going to serve me in the moment mm -hmm. and so when i when i had a kid when i had a baby and i started thinking uh you know i want my child to be around family so me and my wife were gonna uh live where my brother lived and i'd still be in entertainment and all this and the more i i started getting away from that los angeles world the more crazy it looked from the outside Yes. And it all came crashing down when uh, or spiraling up, depending on how you look at it, when the trans child movement kicked off. And I'm in a very interesting position because my piano teacher growing up was trans. trans. So it's like I didn't have this inherent. I knew I didn't have inherent hatred, but I also knew how to uh, identify abuse and insanity. So it's like. So that, that was one reason why I think I could get out of all of this insanity is because, as Shakespeare says, know thyself. I knew I wasn't coming at it from like a, from like a hateful position or a position where I uh, was like prude or something like that. And so I saw what they were trying to normalize with children, and I took a very hard public stance on it. And so I was at CAA at the time and Prince of Young and all these places. Like I was in the, yeah. I wasn't like an A-list comedian. I wasn't like a, uh, like a, like a uh, Kevin Hart or Bill Burr or something like that. But I was, but I was you had in, big. Yeah, I had juice. Fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was, uh, I'd passed, you know, I'd had multiple Comedy Central specials. I was, I'd have a development deal every year about a sitcom around me. I was, uh, headlining theaters and clubs for 15 years. Like I was in the system. I was, yes. And so, and so um, 
there was a horrible backlash to that. And my agents and managers basically said, cause I was already teetering a little because I was uh, pro second amendment openly and stuff like that. But uh, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. But, and I could just kind of, cause that's the irony. This is one reason why I have such disdain for a lot of these mainstream comics is our skill is pattern recognition and to see what the other people don't see. So we can see psyops and I'll, I, I don't know if this is on YouTube, but we, we don't need to get into any of that because that goes against terms and conditions, but we could, I, I know they see it. I'm like, that's what we do. We point out like, like that bit I just showed you is like a lot of people don't realize that that's a song by one Republic and Timberland just said it eh, eh, over it and got credit for it. And yeah. so the fact a comedian sees it and says it, we, that's our job. And so when the Caitlyn Jenner thing came out, I said, my joke was Caitlyn Jenner's woman of the year, but it hasn't been a woman for a full year. That's mathematically impossible. That was my whole bit. <laughs> and then I did the whole LG, uh, LGBT thing about the, the rail, you know, the train to hell, where it's like, it starts with the L's like that Dave Chappelle bit. I remember mine. this bit. That was yes. mine word for word. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so it starts with the L's, which are the least offensive to society. It's like L's, you know, they're, they're into like knickknacking and they have some cats, blah, blah. And then you get the G's and the G's are into like cocaine and real estate. But, and then you get to the B's where they're like, well, fuck anybody. And you're like, anybody, anybody, fuck. And then you get to the T's. And by the time you get to the T's, you know, it's like, we're chopping off our dicks. We're burning down. Society. You know? <laughs> and so I'm like the L's and that my, my joke was like five minutes long. And then it, it goes all the way back to the L's where they're like, we should have just stuck with knickknacking. Cause the whole thing was about, <laughs> Uh, is about alliances and allegiances. That's right. why I don't do allegiances. When people are like, "You burn so many bridges," I'm like, "I'm a free man, and I don't, I don't just, I have like lifelong friends that are really close to me. But if somebody just wants to use me or like do an a, a allegiance or an alliance or form a coalition, as they say, I know it just go, I know it goes nowhere. And I'm a big pattern recognition guy, so some people don't realize that in five years, 10 years, it will be a dead end, but they just don't think that far ahead. And so, um, and so Chappelle does that bit. I'm now kicked off YouTube, Twitter, uh, Instagram 10 times at least, but Instagram was cool. Cause I could just keep coming back. I was like a ghost and now they leave me alone. And now they let me back on Twitter because I think we are retaking a little ground here, but yeah, um, because everything I got kicked off, or pretty much came true. And if you go back, you know, I do forgive some of the people for misunderstanding me because I probably like the reason I wouldn't stop saying certain words, it probably did come across as like, what's up with Owen? Does he legitimately hate black people or something? I'm like, no, no, no. If they take away any of your words, they can take away any of them. You know, it's like, you were, a, you were proving a principle. Exactly. Exactly. And so, because I know how cults actually work and I know how like brainwashing actually works and that's kind of what you do. You, you, it's like out of Star Trek. You say there's four lights when there's three lights and then you hijack someone's mm-hmm. free will. And so, and so many people like, just, just go along to get along. Like stop making waves. And I'm like, no, no, no. Because now I have four kids, you know? <laughs> that's the funniest yeah. part is so- I just kept having kids and I got a farm and yeah, long story short, they kicked me out of everything. And so I just start my own platforms, my own social media, all that. So if you want to subscribe and what I do a two, three hour stream every day. So unauthorized.tv. I'm also on rumble, odyssey, telegram, um, bit shoot, all those platforms. I have my own social media, Bertaria times. It's actually heavily censored, but censored towards the good, the true, the beautiful, where it's like a lot of homesteaders, a lot of family people. Uh, it's social media. If people really want to, uh, feel good about life, like you go mm-hmm. there, everyone's growing stuff. Everyone's crushing. And we started our own magazine. I started farming because I realized, especially during COVID that they're never going to kick in your door and make you do anything. They're just going to take away conveniences. So I'm like making my own butter now and all this shit. And now Can we, it's, wait, wait, yeah. before we get too far on that road, cause I'm really interested in your farming and the butter. I want to talk about <laughs> before we get there. Cause I don't, I'll get lost and not come back. Um, can you just tell me, did you lose, you were talking about you were at Prince Pato and Young and CA, you lost your, did you lose your representation also? All of it. Yeah. 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 
And, and what was the cool a, thing? Well, there, oh, go ahead. Ask, well, sorry. what was their official reason for deplatforming you from YouTube? I can't remember exactly. Did they get tell you uh, a hate reason? speech, trans? I mean, I got when I got kicked okay. off Patreon, they even said like word for word why it was my joke about um, where I was like, I went to one of these feminist rallies and I'm walking around. And I'm telling these girls like, go home. You know, your father loves you, but I'm. But if you're going to make this mistake, here's a condom. And they're like, this isn't why we're here. And I'm like, I've seen the Twitter lady. <laughs> and I'm like, pound me too, pound me too. Easy. That's very thirsty. And so the whole joke was. Oh, hashtag. I get yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, in my world, it's a pound sign. So these ladies just keep saying, pound me too. Pound. So that's my bit. And Patreon said I was, norm I was mocking the victims of sexual abuse. And meanwhile, actual rape victims are like, that's the funniest fucking bit I've ever heard. Because what they were doing, the Me Too, was, uh, was a cover. It was total PSYOP, in my opinion. Like, total nonsense movement. Uh, because they're the ones doing all this shit, but they have to, like, feed the masses something so that they don't come with pitchforks, you know, for the Weinsteins of the world. And there's a lot more than Weinstein, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, and so I sued Patreon for over two years. Like, I'm a fighter. Like, I don't... I don't when, like, I don't have that retreat instinct that, that some men do. And I, I do think it's soy and fluoride and pornography. I really you do. Mean, I, think, I think there's a mean, physical you, element to men becoming cowards. Yeah. Let me, let me uh, to be clear, you're saying there's a physical element to men. Uh, like, you're saying soy, things like this are leading to pornography and fluoride. Yeah. yeah. I really, because it's, it's not, I can't explain it any other way. It's like the male instinct is like, not on my watch. No, you don't get to come at me like that. That we have principles, we provide we provide and protect for future generations. The amount of men that just go, that just lie on their back, like I'm a, a pretty mellow guy, ironically. I can speak in a way that's entertaining, but that's just because I, I you know, that's my job. But I'm typically not a legalistic guy. I don't like run around looking for fights. I don't like killing chickens. You know what I mean? I'm like not that dude. But I saw that there was no other way. It's like when they were starting to censor everything, there was no ability to be a comedian if they kept going with that. So I drew lines in the sand. And fortunately, thousands of people stuck with me. But yeah. So many men are like not. And so I can't figure out what it is. I think, I think porn might be a psychological operation to get men to wire their brain like they're watching other people have sex, which is almost like a way to like break a guy. Like think mm -hmm. about in reality when that would happen. It's when you got conquered. Like when would a man watch other people just like banging for hours? Like that makes no yeah. sense. If you think it's about like, it differently, a lot of these things that we've just accepted as – yeah, this is culturally normal. But if you yeah, exactly. just look at yeah. it from a different angle like you're doing and you're like, why do we why have we conditioned ourselves to watch other people have sex? And and then if you look at the studies, look, porn, for example, I've had people write me when I talked about getting sober the first Good time. Uh, thank you. It's been it'll be four years in October. So my husband and I got sober together and the, after the first year I wrote an essay about it and I had people reach out to me about different kinds of addictions. And one guy, his story backed up what I've read in the studies. He was like, I have an addiction to porn. I've developed an addiction and I'm no longer turned on by my wife. And it's a problem. Yeah, and that's a horrible problem. The data shows that too. It's not just an anecdote, you know? Um, yeah, and so it's I a huge uh, programming tool where it starts off with like a, a pinup of a naked girl or something. And then it starts being like these like naughty or more deviant scenarios that brings about that social change. Like it's really and, and, uh, and, and there is instances in history where a conquering army has just started flooding the, the country with porn, like whether it's pamphlets or on television or blah, blah, because it it cucks and it uh, feminizes the men and it also lowers the population and does all this stuff. You know, it's great. You got off. Uh, you got sober, though, because there's a lot of fluoride and in, in, uh, in, uh, alcohol like I, you there's know, a, I, there's a lot I of booze and alcohol. Too. There's a lot of what? <laughs> booze. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm from a town where there aren't sober people. So like I never even knew it was possible to be sober. And uh, and yeah, it's the move. 
it's like uh, alcohol and, and drugs are definitely a way to keep you lower vibratory and and just in, in prisons, you know? Yeah, well, it can really, really easily become. Have you read um, Brave New World in a while? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, where he talks about Soma and like in the introduction to that book, uh, when he re-released, he talked about the conditions necessary to to have a society like in like in Brave New World. And one of them was the development of some kind of drug that was very pleasurable, but didn't have all these negative side effects. And so mm. sometimes I'm thinking like, what is that drug for our society? It's maybe it's the internet. Maybe it's porn. It's probably something different for different people. Yeah, but for exactly. me, but for me, it was booze. It was like, you could just like check out every day and maybe you're never that person who's like completely, um, you know, falling down uh, naked outside a, su a supermarket <laughs> or something. I don't yeah, know, yeah, yeah. but you're, but still it's like every day you're not doing deep thinking. Cause you're, you're kind of just sort of uh, enjoying the bread and circuses, you know, like. Absolutely. And that's one reason why I never thought I, I should quit drinking. Cause I also like every now and then I'll have some like local thing, like meat or some shit, but like I, cause I was always a good drunk quote unquote mm -hmm. where I would, I was like you, it's like, Alcohol was always my vice, where it's like a great conversation, like that first pour, the bubble. And it, I associated love with it because an acceptance and friendship and all these associations I had. Yeah, yeah, good times, bonfires, laughs, like. And so, um, but as when I had kids, you know, after my first baby, I'm like, I can't be like checked out. Like, let's say somebody steps on a nail or. We can't find them. And, and I live on a farm where there's like wolves and shit. Like I literally live out of like, it's one of those like Hans Christian Anderson <laughs> novels. And so I can't, I have to always be present. And so that was why I realized that I wasn't going to be drunk again. And so I haven't been drunk in years, wow. you know? And so, I have to uh, say, you look really good. It's been you. a while since I've seen one of your videos and you just look really, you look very youthful and vibrant <laughs> thank you yeah feel, yeah because that's the thing i was going to tell you is uh is living naturally like i do now so many of these things that they do to people is right in nature and it's really obvious like i have this video i should have sent it to you i don't know if you saw it but i i, I use my goats and i show how society works where and it went hyper viral on tiktok before they deleted my tiktok but the grain is like sugar and porn and booze and then it starts eating it and then I put them in debt. Like I put the thing around their neck and then I take the white gold. Like I take their future, you know, like the milk uh, and oh yeah. And then I, and then I, I castrate, you know, a few of them and I call them brave and beautiful. You know, I'm like LGBT, you know, and I just take their balls because <laughs> I don't want them breeding. And so then I, and, and, I'm, and people's minds were like blown when I was showing that to them. And I also show how gatekeepers work, like how pastures are rotated like how this is all nature because there are people that farm people and oh, I'm yeah. not, yeah. And I'm not like angry about it. And I could tell one reason why I reached out to you and said exactly on Twitter is because you didn't seem angry. And that's so important these days because right now a lot is being disclosed. Like a lot is being released. And I was telling this to people six years ago where I was going through these emotions and one of them was anger where I was like, these people are, stealing from us they're like lying to us i went through a lot of this deprogramming stuff that you're talking about and i was like if this all comes out at the same time there could be a serious problem in society because now i'm like way past all those stages like i'm just grateful and now i see that there are a lot of people that almost want to be farmed like they don't want to be in yes. the wilderness yeah they they it's comfortable it's comfortable it's yeah you know it's safe it's like the great the great unknown, like it's sort of uh, an analogy would be if you're in a bad relationship or a bad job Exa yes, or something, exactly. but yeah. you're afraid to leave it because at least you know it and you don't know what's the, in the unknown. And I, I think people are like that with what you're talking about. Absolutely. I understand uh, the analogy that you're making of like people being farmed, but that's what we know. And so it's so comfortable, like to do what you've done. Let's, let's talk a little bit about leaving LA, buying a farm, uh, you know, becoming a dad four times over and all the stuff you're like, you're raising goats, you're making butter. Like what is, what, what, what is this life been like for you? Do you feel like you're, you just so like, I'm, I'm getting off the grid. Is it sort of a getting off the grid thing or is it like, no, I'm just going to pursue what's meaningful. 
Yeah, that's exactly it. Like I'm not getting, like I'm not hiding. Like some people had this misunderstanding of me that I was like going off in the woods to like hide or something. And that's not true at all. You know, we're very active in our local community. I'm shooting another hour special uh, Labor Day weekend in Missouri. I just didn't want to be a part of their, their lives, like the pyramid, you know? And so I'm out in the wilderness, but in the wilderness, life is harder, but there's no limits and it's way more meaningful. And it's, it's interesting. You just brought up, you know, like meaning and purpose because uh, that's pretty much what I pursue now. Like lately I've been really into my farm stand. Like we now sell uh, homemade uh, soap and, and stuff we grow and uh, eggs and butter and all this stuff. And I find it fascinating to be part of the means of production you know, and it, it's not out of fear at all. Like, I'm not afraid of Los Angeles. I just think it's like dirty and gross. And I wouldn't want my children to see that, like, just to be around that because it's mm-hmm. so, you know, and I do feel for a lot of these people. I think that they're just under so many lies and they're motivated by so many ridiculous things that they're just kind of like in a hell of themselves. But I, I know some people that farm in Southern California and they have a great life. You know, it's, it's yeah. all like the decision you make. It's not even the geography. It's like how you live your life and how many lies are you under, you know? Mm-hmm. I, so I was in LA for 15 years, my old life. And I was a manager, a uh, comedy manager, worked with Margaret Cho and um, Debbie Kamal Bell, who's uh, thoroughly woke. I was thoroughly woke. And, yeah. um, and the, the part of comedy I worked in was probably different from where you were. Cause I was very niche and it was, uh, I worked with a lot of comedians who were pushing social justice in their comedy. I thought this is the way I'm making a difference. And yeah, I, I used to be like that too. Yeah. And, and yeah. And so I, it's interesting cause you said 2016 is when you got married, had a child. 2016 is when I left LA. It's when I started questioning my whole belief system and everything moved to Texas, but it was like a slow, process for me of leaving that stuff behind and the reason i'm interested in what you're doing now it's because um well we have my husband i just bought this old house we've been renovating it and we're not like on a farm we don't have that much land but we are out in the boonies you don't need that much land yeah we're gonna do a big i I'll have to send you pictures when we get it done because we're gonna we have a lot of plans for our little plot you know curtis stone (laughs) no Oh, I gotta say, I gotta hook you guys up. He ha- he has this really popular YouTube channel. I mean, now he has a massive amount of land, but it was called uh, Urban Farmer. Okay, he's out of uh, out of Canada. He showed what you can do on an eighth of an acre, and it's mind blowing. Okay, yeah, okay, like that's, I, that's why we became friends because you know being able to like reach and touch these dreams is so much cooler to me than. Then the people that are like, here's my thousand acres. It's like a nation. Like I, I do all this stuff. Cause, <laughs> cause so many people are like, yeah, but how do you do it? Like, what do you do? You plant a fucking seed. Like, you know, when, when someone on the outside is trying to get into the dream, it sounds like such a monumental effort that to see a guy living in an urban environment who started a ability to sell, like he was making a living, just selling crops at a uh, farmer's market from an eighth of an acre I I just thought that that was so cool because that's what I like to bring to people. It's like how to just start really with a few chickens, a tomato plant in the window, you know? So it makes me, what you're doing, it strikes me that you're, you said being involved in the process of production stuff, you're closer to real, you're closer to human reality and survival. Like to what's, what actually means something and what's important. Whereas in LA, and a lot of places in the States are like, this doesn't, but LA, I think in particular, cause there's so many people there chasing fame or money or things like that. Um, it, there's a lot of desperation and there's a lot of disconnect from like the real world, mother nature. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's people running their mouths and all this stuff. And I'm like, you're, you're, you know, we're, we're like seconds away from death at all times. I mean, like when, whenever you slaughter animals and you like, you know, take the meat and all that there's like a few arteries where they get nicked it just pump 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 and you're out like we are like this these water nymphs with a soul and a spirit like i love human beings like i'm not being dark we're not animals we are different we have a spark that separates us from animals that being said it's like they're so detached from what they're living in like if you look at los angeles you look at the 10 the 405 it's like, and all those people, they're in what I would consider a slaughterhouse. Like, it's like, that's horrifying. 
because there's no exit, there's no water, there's no cohesive community at all. And uh, at any point, a, a switch flips, and that's just a, a really, really terrible situation. Here's the funny thing about living in a really real situation is I, that's why I'm not anti-government, which is so funny because you would think I would be. Because I, I, I'm like so far down the road that I'm like, I'm so grateful that I have municipalities to protect the roads from pirates. Yes. <laughs> yes. Like, like I, I'm like, we have supply chains. Like I can get things that are hard to come by in nature. And I know how hard nature can be on people. It's very liberating, but it's, it can be brutal. And so the fact I have Amazon, I have a Home Depot, I have you know, the U.S. government is capable of monitoring supply chains and provides us with uh, currency. Like, I know all this shit is nonsense. Like, you know, here's Canadian money, but I know it's all like a, a <laughs> Especially joke. Especially Canadian money. Yeah, yeah. But at <laughs> the same time, it's like allowing us to build right now. And if that were to turn off, like if the government were to fall, the Fed closed its doors. I mean... I hope and I pray and I feel like we'd survive and I'm sure that we'd learn a lot and all that, but it would be, it would be monumental. And I live in an area where I'm best friends with like guys that work for Homeland Security and now run their own, you know, training courses and giant farmers and all these people. And I still would be like, man, I, I really like having the government to kind of just sit there and keep. I call, I call uh, cartels and warlords mom and pop governments. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> because that's all they are. Because, like, if you understand that, I, I know I can be I, rambly, but I'm really enjoying this conversation. If, if, like, if you look at what the government is, the government is basically a gang. And that, that doesn't mean to get rid of them. It just is what it is. It's a protection racket. And yes. They, they provide you, uh, you know, private property rights and, uh, you know, safe passage on the roads. And in turn, you give them a portion of your labor. That's thousands of years old. So if that were to fall, there would be a vacuum that would emerge. And then you would have mom and pop governments shooting up, which are called yes. cartels, gangs, you know, yes. warlords. And it's like, then it, like, then there's a lot of carnage because then all of those mom and pop governments, I did a sketch seven years ago called uh, about me trying to start a mom and pop prison. <laughs> it's pretty funny. I'm like, you know, I, I'm like, uh, there's no capital and capital punishment. I'm like, it's all about, and I was going like door to door with small businesses because I wanted to start my own prison. And I'm like big, uh, I, I can't remember what some of the jokes, but you'd laugh. But anyway, it's the same with governments. Like all a cartel is, all a gang is, is they're offering protection. They're offering justice to an area. The irony is a lot of cartels right now are offering more justice than the United States government for like pedos and rapists and shit. And mm -hmm. that's why the people like them. The, the idea that they're always just terrorizing is not true. And so the United States government has figured out how to keep their poppy fields and their drug shit overseas and a lot of their like gang wars overseas. And they keep this area relatively safe. And I, I kind of like it. I went down the, um, the path of, I knew some, know some people who are like anarcho capitalist right and cap yeah. and i went down that path of thinking about that for a while a good while and the, ultimately i came to the conclusion that like i think some of those people don't understand first they don't understand human nature the nature of the yeah. human heart like the nature of evil or even their mm -hmm. own evil capacity for evil exactly. and they would always say it would come back to well we don't need government because each community would um you know choose to police <laughs> itself and we would have and they were describing basically cartels and mobs we would have people who would come and do i'm like but how do you what if the mob uh is on the side of the people who killed your brother how do you get justice for exactly the who killed your brother and yeah it just it would yeah the logistics least... the logistics make them all spiral when you're like how do you stop child sex trafficking if all parties involved are consenting? Yes. And they're like, well, you know, there's an age. I'm like, what age, why, and who gets to determine that? Is it 25 when your brain stops developing? Is it when you go through puberty at 11? Is it 18? Like, at what point can someone choose to sell their body for money to an old man? Mm -hmm. And they're like, I'm like, three, four? And they're like, no, how dare you? No, I'm like, no, no, no. In your world... As long as people have a contract, there is no ability to do a non-aggression principle. I, I couldn't force them out of a contract. At what age and why 
is someone conscious enough to enter a contract? And they don't have, they've never thought any of this shit through. I'm like, listen, as someone who's warlord adjacent, <laughs> I'm not a warlord. I'm not, a, I get it. But it's like, I've had to think of these things. Like if the shit really does hit the fan, what set of rules, how do you do it? Like, how do you keep your community going? Like, how do you have punishment? If you order a pizza, you develop a government. You have a treasurer who collects the money. You have your commerce department who goes and gets it. It's like these narco-capitalists, because uh, uh, I'm, I have a libertarian heart. So like, mm -hmm. I don't typically want to force anything on anyone. So right. I understand that mentality, but it's like so wrong, but I get it. That's why I can communicate with them. Cause I'm the same yeah. way. I'm like, I don't ever want to tell you what to do with your life. And that's why me and you both have a similar background of like drinking tons of liquor in <laughs> Los Angeles, changing the world. You know, I was the same way. I'm like, we got to, we got to break down some social norms. These fucking people don't know that we're just crushing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, not at all. <laughs> you know, we were on all of these institutions. We we're relying on all these institutions without even giving them credit, like the commerce, the the giant farms, the the currency we're using, the assumptions. One thing that blew my mind, which is why the trans child thing woke me up, is I was under the impression that we all kind of knew right from wrong that that like there were lines and like we wouldn't cross them and we and adults can just be happy and all, and, and there there isn't you know when I saw people screaming in bloody euphoria for forty week abortions in New York I was like what the fuck you know yeah <laughs> it's like that's a bit like three of my kids were like so were like uh. In, in like the early 30 weeks, you know, because I'm basically a Nephilim, I'm 6'8". So uh, my, uh, <laughs> my children <laughs> came a little early because my wife is like 5'5". Five, five. And, um, <laughs> and so I know that those are living people. So they couldn't, I, when they were doing this like partial birth abortion shit, I'm like, is there no off switch? And the answer is no. And so that's why yeah. I tell some of these anarcho-capitalist guys, I'm like, if the government were to fail, I'll make you a slave out of principle just to teach you a lesson. <laughs> and you are the type who would. I would. <laughs> you would I'd prove like, the principle. Yes, I would. <laughs> I'd be like, just it. It's like, no, private property. I go, who grants you that? Is it a deed? Who enforces that? What is private property? Have you thought about what that means? It's like, no, stay off my land. It's like, what's your land? What, what, if, right. what if I perceive the world as my land is wherever the buffalo go? Like, what if I'm a hunter gatherer? What if I'm like, okay, in this season, I go where the, the berries are in bloom and that goes right through your yard. This is the con this is the main fight between American Indians and farming settlers. It was not racial, it was it was paradigms. So the the white settlers or black settlers, or whatever, because there were non-white settlers, but the paradigm was farming, where it's this is my square, British common law. And the Indians would be like, I go where coyote go, you know? Mm -hmm. And Very you're like, no, no. Thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so I see how they both think where it's like, because I, I, I understand hunting. A lot of my best friends are like major hunters. So it's like where the elk go is where your tribe goes. You're following the elk. And if that goes through a farmer's land, you know, then there's war. And the, and the Indian was like, he didn't even understand that concept where he's like, no, but the elk is going this way. And, and the farmer's like, this is my square. And the anarcho-capitalist is completely blind to that. They're like, well, my land. I'm like, I go where the eagle goes, and I'll make you a slave. And they're like, how dare you? And I'm like, dude, you don't even know what you're fucking talking about. <laughs> they, In some ways, they actually remind me of – I got to the point where I realized they – in some ways they remind me of the postmodern like Marxist, the woke in some ways, because there's this, um, this, this idea that if we do these things, we'll reach a utopia where exactly. everyone yeah. behaves in a perfect way. Also right. that would like not an understanding of what humans are like and, or what they are like. And, and without, so, so ultimately I decided, no, I was, I was considered, I was you. like for a while, I'm like, so narco-capitalism maybe yeah we don't need a government like and eventually i'm like no i think this is sort of a something you if, if it's a fantasy because and it's because exactly communism yeah. you're so right because i i did a lot of research on genocides and because i wanted because people keep telling like because people were always because i'd have these ideas of like let's have our own gardens and our own stuff and 
And they'd say, no, they'll just come get you. They'll just come kick in your door and take all your shit. And I'm like, hmm, well, I was a World War II history major, and that isn't actually what happened, you know? And then I started looking into Ukraine and, you know, the Holodomor and all that stuff. And one of the main things that always precedes a genocide is a lot of debt. So all these peasants, a lot of these, no offense to the dead, but a lot of them, you know, were referred to as peasants. They'd be in a lot of debt. And then these whispering fuckers, and whether or not they're fascist, communist, anarcho-capitalist, doesn't matter. It's all the same whispers. It's like that evil satanic whisper yeah. that they would get you to overthrow the landlords. And now they can do that in a variety of ways, but that's exactly right. Utopia will come if you take away your chains. Those are your chains, your bondage. It's you know the Luciferian thing. Yeah. It's, it's uh, even the apple. Yeah. It's, yeah, exactly. It's, uh, yeah. Yeah. God. It's like you, God yeah, exactly. Go God is keeping you down from expressing yourself. And then comes hell every time. So it's the same thing. I was, I was telling my audience that because you see that with just workers and foremen or owners and workers where you have this like pride of the laborer and then, you know, the disdain from the landowner of the dumb uh, masses. And you see the same in the home with the male and the female, you know, the, the whisper, the Satan is like the man and the woman, like the whispering to the woman, you want to be like the man, you want to wear pants and get all the credit and you should be the airline pilot and you should be a war general. And then they whisper to the man, you should be beautiful. You should, you should cut off your dick or whatever. You know, it's like you should wear fancy pants and dresses and you should be adorned with like pearls and diamonds and everyone should love you, you know? And then they get to a point where they shirk their own responsibilities and destroy their own home. And guess who? Pro the only benefit of that is Satan. Satan looks at God and says, look at what I made them do. I am the special boy. And it's the same with labor. It's like, you, you should live in the castle. You should live in the big house. Like no one appreciates you. You should kill them. You should kill them all. And, and, and that's whether or not it's anarcho-capitalism, capital, uh, communism, fascism, it's all the same shit. It's always, you deserve more. You deserve what they have. Meanwhile, I've been a laborer and an owner. And I'll tell you, there's pluses and minuses to both. Like if you own the land and people are working on your land, it's a ton of responsibility. You could go bankrupt, you know, fucking... It's like the managerial uh, ability to keep business flowing and keeping people paid and all this thing. Like between all my businesses, I have like several employees now and it's like pressure. There yeah. is some peace in just digging a hole and having someone give you money and you get to go buy shit, you know? Yeah. And so th they both have pluses and minuses. And so the landowner has tremendous responsibility, but also gets to own the land, which is great. Like, I'm not saying that's not great. But the laborer gets to have that piece of just doing the work and getting the money. But then someone else has to make the money, like the existence of the money. You know, like this is this is a spell, you know. And so when you're first going through the, the rabbit hole, you're like, oh, fiat, it's not even backed by gold. It's like fucking nothing. It's all a trick and a lie. And so I went through that. And then I'm like, yeah, but what is this? This is a contract. This is an understanding where I give you this, you give me what we have mutually agreed upon is worth a hundred dollars. And that's a service. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to come up with that. And I'm so anarcho capitalist by nature that I literally pay people in silver. Sometimes I have zero debt, no credit cards, no mortgage. I have a well, I have, I, I'm like, I live what they claim that they're living. And I'm telling you, like you want currency, you want a government, you want a police force because outside these walls are some fucking uh, crazy forces. And I, and I think with the government, at least, though it is like a mob, I completely yeah. agree. At least there's this um, illusion. There are these certain laws and principles that they're supposed to uphold. And you can, th I think there's a greater chance of seeking justice within those principles than there would be if, I don't know what mob would come along if there's no government. Like, what, what are they, they're going to have to come up with new rules and new laws or, you know, create oh, new. Horrifying. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Horrifying. And that's when you get into tribalism where it's like, because, you know, I do think races exist and people should have a right to live how they live and blah, blah, blah. But I'm not I don't think that uh, one race is like superior to another and has a right to dominate another. And so but there are people that think that and that would actually be fairly horrifying, even if it was white people. Like where it's like, OK, we the, the right is this race or this lineage. That's OK. If you create that. Think about how many evil people can hide within that, where they just have this like skin 
so they can be murderers and rapists and, and thieves. And then the rule of law is just what nationality are you? Mm-hmm. And that's why that's been done away with like, you know, centuries ago, these things have all been like hammered out. And that's why I like our ecclesiastical court system. It's right out of the Bible. You have the 12 apostles, the 12 jurors, you have the accuser, the Satan, the judge, you know, it's, it's all, it's all like if one apostle goes with you, you know, to the foot of the cross, you're innocent. Like you don't get to be, you don't, you're not killed. And there's a grave punishment for killing that, which wasn't yours. And then you have the resurrection, you know, I could, this is just wow. my opinion, but I, yeah. I see because I was called for jury duty, and I'm a pretty naturally trippy guy. <laughs> so, I'm <just laughs> like, so I'm just like looking at how it's all working, and I was like, "Oh, this is the Bible." You know, you have the defendant. That's why Jesus would always answer a question with a question. You know, you have a right to remain silent. You don't. You don't have to incriminate yourself. And then you have the accuser, the Satan, and then you have the judge who's representing of the God. And then you have the 12 apostles. Uh, and if even one of them stands by you at the cross, you don't go to jail. And I'm just watching this and I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, it's a good system. And then people are like, no, don't you know Hunter Biden is smoking crack? And I'm like, yes, it's corrupted. Everything's corrupted. But that the, the heart of man is corrupted. And yes, everything can be Yeah, corrupt. it's like, yeah, you get your, you yeah. get your little Q, your, your Q, uh, uh, little, uh, what were they called? The military tribunals where you're hanging Tom Hanks. All these people are talking about that. I'm like, you don't think they're going to be corrupt? You don't think someone yeah. with power would just be like, and fuck that guy too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? And that's all why of history. it's all about the 12. Yeah. Right. All of history shows that's the case. There's exactly. always somebody who's like the back. Oh, and then I'm going to stab you in the back once we get there and, uh, you know, make my own rules. And yeah. And that's why the 12 <laughs> is so important. Cause you have your Judas, you have your, uh thomas you have but as long as there's one like in 12 you're gonna get one out of all of them that is the honest man or the honest woman and so that's why i think it's pretty cool and i I, i'm not looking to torture destroy that which i can't uh solve you know one thing i tell my audience is i'm like uh I'm like, don't even criticize anything that you're not willing to improve upon or offer an alternative to. Because that's like a plague right now where it's like. You know what? That's an Eckhart. So when I first started leaving Woke, and I didn't even realize that's what I was doing at the time. But I I read The Power of Now, which a therapist suggested by Eckhart Tolle. And I tell people because it's kind of funny to me now. But that when I first, I was so against like self-help books that I listened to it on like two and a half times the speed. So I could get the power of now, like very fast. <laughs> you wanted it now. it now. Now, now, now. <laughs> but it was actually great. It surprised me. I went back and listened to it again. And then I read it. And he has a quote, what you're saying. It's, uh, it's about how, you know, if you're unhappy in a situation, I can't remember the exact wording, but he says, you either leave it or you change it or you just accept it. Because criticism, like constant um just being unhappy with the situation, but not willing or able to change it and not willing or able to leave it and not willing to accept it. Like you're, you're just making yourself miserable. And that's kind of, that's so true. That's it's right on the money where it's like, it, it, why accept this? I think that causes dementia and cancer. Like when you just sit in that state, like I think lying causes Alzheimer's and dementia where if you have to accept lies and like live a lie, your mind starts fragmenting where you have to constantly think, well, what do I believe versus what does this person believe versus what's the lie I've accepted? And your mind just starts like, it's like a sidewalk that's, that's getting hot and cold, just starts cracking. And I think the same thing happens with resentment and you know, uh, constantly being unsatisfiable, where your body just starts like imploding. Because I believe in an afterlife. I don't know what it entails, but I believe that we have a soul that goes on. Mm-hmm. And I think that there is a moment where your soul just starts like being like, all right, if you can't handle this, we're fucking out of here. And it just starts breaking apart your body, you know, and then you just you're out of here. Can I ask you about resentment? Because you're talking about that whispering voice yeah, yeah. All, throughout history and and about human nature. And um, I pulled it up because I couldn't remember it, but it made me think of uh, the Nietzsche's, the tarantulas. I don't know if you've read that, but I'll send it to you if not. Yeah, he, he basically writing about like human nature doesn't change lots of things change but our nature i think 
there's always been like when I first read that, it blew my mind because I thought, oh, my gosh, he's writing about social justice types of people. But actually, he's writing about just all different kinds. That personality type has always existed. Yeah. And, uh, and so how do you keep being that given that resentment and listening to that that whispering voice? If you deserve this, you yeah, yeah. entitlement voice. What is your practice? Which what's your behavior system for keeping that out of your heart? Because uh, because it, it never goes away, and so that's that's something to really accept. And I know, like most sober people, realize that because at any point you could be like, you know, because the, the, there's an addiction to that resentment, almost like liquor, you know, where at any point you could just think like, man, how good would that taste right now? And then you have to like nip that in the bud, you know. And so that resentment voice that that bubbles up. The way I deal with it is uh, a lot like that movie Revolver. Have you seen Revolver? No, I don't think so. Oh, my God. You're going to love <laughs> okay. them. It's Jason Statham. So typically, you wouldn't think that like deep, profound wisdom would come from a Jason Statham movie, but, <laughs> but it does. It's like one of the deepest. It's uh, directed by Guy Ritchie. Okay. And I don't even want to ruin anything. for. I just you, Just watch it. Just okay. watch that movie and... But okay, but one of the things of the movie that won't ruin it, but uh, Andre 3000's character in it says, if you're the devil, where would you hide? Like, where would you hide? And the answer is the closest to you the devil could possibly be, which is your own inner monologue. So one of the things I like to ask myself is, is that me? You know, like if someone's like, look at all those comedians in LA, they're crushing so hard. They think you're so fucking stupid. You know, like something like that, you know? And you go, is that me? Do, do I really think that? Or would I be like disgusted? Or like, is that, if actually given the opportunity, would I change anything? And the answer is no. So I know, so you have yourself and then you have this like little whispery guy and he sounds like you, you know? And a lot of times the people that think that that's the craziest, like if I say that, someone go, oh, you're schizophrenic or like, no. you sound crazy. And I'm like, he's got you. Because your whole inner monologue is like is that the guy. Whisper. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yes. And so, and so there is this inner monologue, and it's not just it's not just bad like the ego, the that can be hijacked by the Satan. That that can uh, self protect you in times of trauma. Like when people say, "Oh, you have an ego," it's like, yeah, you puff up and you have an ego in times of like trauma. That's why. The system likes to overly traumatize kids because then that's them, you know, where you react, you puff up. No, no one's coming for me, you know? And so that ego serves a purpose. It's not just bad. You don't need to eliminate your ego. But if you're letting that ego take control of who you actually are, then you're entering a realm of hell. You know, that's like the hell. It's the accuser. And so um, that's how I keep it under control. And I'm just very grateful, you know, like my family, uh, you know, like at, at every dinner we say like prayers, but it's not like super dogmatic. It's just like, what are we grateful for? And like, who yes. do we think about? And so every meal we have together, it's like, and I can see how great my kids are like being raised this way where they just think like, I'm grateful for my family, this great day, this awesome food. And then we pray for like Grandpa Jack with cancer. We pray for blah, blah, blah. And so if you stay in that zone, the whisper stays away because you're constantly reminding yourself, what are you grateful for? Who uh, requires your prayers? Like who is somebody that could be helped? Because if you're thinking in the service of others, you don't have that cancerous, uh, you know, that cancerous obsession of yourself. You know, if you're like. Because you're, you're taking the like, antidote. You're taking yeah. that gratitude antidote constantly constantly and it has to be daily in my opinion i don't know what it has to be but it's just like if you're just like look up like i'm so grateful that we have uh that we have a blue sky today i'm grateful for this rain i'm grateful for blah 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 it really is a practice it's like exercise you know it's like a practice that you will see reshaping your inner world and also think of other people like how can i better serve my listeners is what i think or how can i better serve my wife or how can I better serve my community? And then you don't even look at yourself. And when you're looking out, you know, uh, it just doesn't have that cancerous. Cause I could have went down that road. And sometimes it still lingers up where it's like, I mean, I had like the no number one comedian in the world stealing my jokes and they all said I was crazy. And I couldn't, 
uh, say anything back because I was kicked off all the platforms. And I'm like, that, but that was a gift. Like that was it. Like all these things are gifts from God where it's like, what are you going to do with that? Are you going to implode? Are you going to be resentful? Are you going to say that I wish the world was different? Are you going to see this as an opportunity to burn dead wood and rise in ways you could never imagine, you know? And that's why you resonated with me. Like, dude, I, because where I live in Sandpoint, Idaho, we're, a lot of us are like this. So my buddy, Dan, who's this genius, like legitimate genius, he texts me your clip and he goes, everybody in Sandpoint, I showed you that screenshot. And, uh, and it's so true. It's like, you wouldn't go back. You know, you wouldn't, if you could have it over, you wouldn't, you're not resentful. You're not just like constantly bitching and screaming at the sky about what should be, you know, because that's social justice to the truther movement can stay in the upside down if you don't go grateful. Because I know truthers that are just like, ah, the fucking chemtrails, oh, yeah. the 5G. And, the, and, yes. and I'm like, you might as well just be bitching about like, you know, with the Racism. social justice yeah. war, yes. racism and bigotry. <laughs> And so, yeah. and it really is, it's just the same behavior. You just switch your mark. It's just like, you know, so I, have, I saw that you switched it and that's why I was like, yes. Oh, uh, I love that. I love, I, so much of what you're saying resonates with me. You know what it's like when you feel like what you, you discover something that to you is an epiphany. Maybe you learn it the hard way. I've learned a lot of things the hard way. Yeah. yeah, yeah me And too. then you hear someone <laughs> else talking about it and you're like, <laughs> Yes, I discovered that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like, I know what I think I know what you're talking about because it's uh prayer. I try and talk so on my channel, uh, I do have a lot of atheist people at deprogram who are very uh tolerant of me talking about God, the atheists who are here. Um, and then every once in a while, if I do an interview somewhere else, I'll come into contact with um the other kind of atheists. And so there are a lot of those in the comments on the Peter Vagosian. Uh, video and I hadn't interacted with one of those kind of atheists in a while so I was re and there are a lot of them who are like oh she found God she just left one cult for another cult why doesn't she do you know it's this very yeah, yeah, angry resentful closed-minded and I was talking about my husband last night and I said you know it's interesting because I think those people on a gut level they remind me of the woke in two ways because they think they know everything yeah exactly they're closed-minded and they're there's that resentfulness that real like negative biting 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 attitude where i don't know it's what you're describing to me where you said the truth there's like some of them it's 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 almost it doesn't even matter what your ideology is at the in the day in some ways if you're anti-woke or woke or if you're a christian or not or wh whatever it, it it's about how you're living yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. And what you just said, it's like that you, you have to have other people agree with you. Because I've had a lot of issues with quote unquote Christians. And I get why people have that reaction. Because a lot mm -hmm. of them, you know, the how dare you? You know, like, I, <laughs> I, like I've had that whole like only this church, only this way, only this interpretation right, right. or else you're going to hell. You're going to hell. And I'm like, and so I, I get was it. raised in a, an abusive Catholic town. And so I get why they're rebelling. But it's you know, they should really grow up at some point and realize that, you know, they're rebelling against the fallen man, not God, mm -hmm. you know, and also there are no atheists. You know, I, I sometimes have some fun with my friends about, um, about, you know, the most hardcore atheists are the biggest NASA guys. And I'm like, that's just a religion. You just don't know you're in a religion. The, Wait, the describe NASA. that. What do you mean? The biggest oh, hardcore like, atheists are the the, oh, like the biggest hardcore atheists are like, Oh, it's all the Bible's a lie. It's all bullshit. There's no God. You guys are all idiots. They're usually the the biggest NASA fans, and I oh, okay. and, and, and I'm like and, and I'm like okay. So you have Collins, Neil Armstrong, and Buzz Aldrin. The Trinity landed on the moon. You have the the Holy Ghost up there, and then and then I'm like and then they can't go back. We're all waiting for the second coming of the moon. And I'm like explaining it. I'm like, <laughs> you realize that those are pagan gods, right? Apollo, Gemini, Artemis. I'm like. You're in a religion. You just don't know it. And it's all the same shit. They have their like, they have their kosher rules, their veganism, you know, their holy water, the vaccines. I'm like, you're just in a religion. Like you're, you're following the same thing. And so, uh, because the jet propulsion laboratory was started by a guy named Jack Parsons. I used to do a, a physics podcast at Caltech. I'm, I used to just, I still love the scientific method, but I loved everything science. I was, a, uh, I was into space and all that shit. 
And the farther I got with it and the more like Nobel Prize winners I interviewed, the more I started, you know, my little uh, Sherlock Holmes, you know, pipe came out. And I realized that it was it was just like mostly bullshit. And like then you look into Jack Parsons and Jack Parsons was best friends with L. Ron Hubbard. And they had like a bet of who could start a bigger religion, Scientology or NASA. And, you know, I think NASA kind of won. OK, I'm going to have to look all of this up. Because he kind of lost me a little bit with Jack. Wait, who is Jack Parsons again? Jack Parsons started the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Okay. So, so um, NASA was started by a Nazi named Werner von Braun. <laughs> okay. okay. There's, a, there's a whole. <laughs> there's something. There's. There, we could just stay on the other stuff because this is going to drive. Yeah. Okay. You, you think that, you think the God stuff drives people nuts? You go at NASA and you go at Werner von Braun. Okay. There was something called Operation Paperclip where they took all the all the uh, biggest Nazi scientists and they brought them to America and they started NASA. And so you've uh, given me I, just enough to go down a good rabbit hole. Yeah. Have some fun with okay. that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, but we don't need to, that need, doesn't need yeah. to be like a point of contention. Can I, uh, cause I don't know how much longer I have you. I don't want to keep you too long. So just quickly, I did want to come back to comedy. We started with like your career in comedy. Um, where do you, and at one point during this discussion, you said, you think maybe we're scoring some wins, like uh, tw you're back on Twitter, like maybe the culture yeah, yeah. is shifting a little. Where do you see things headed on that big scale? As someone who is uh, able to recognize patterns, do you think we're turning things around? What do you, where do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Today? Absolutely. Well, comedy is opening up again, but they're still on a leash because that's where the whisper came with me is like during COVID, I felt like everything was going my way because like, I'm like for a few years, 2017, 2018, 2019, I'd book my own theaters and they would cancel on me uh, like that week, even if I sold out because of like all these calls they were getting about how I'm a bigot, racist, homophobe, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I was getting a little pissed, but then, you know, I started doing my own shows in like warehouses and uh, barns and airport hangers and stuff. And so I felt almost cool. Like I was like, uh, it was almost like the, the uh, the rave scene in like the early nineties. It was yeah. like, oh, you don't want to let me in? I'll we'll do it in a in a warehouse. And that's where like yeah. a lot of that culture did. And it was so fun. But I did have that like feeling of like, why I'm not allowed in theaters. You know, it's like you won't let me in a club. You won't let me in a theater. I, my my picture was hanging on the wall. Like my 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 face is painted on the wall of the Hollywood Improv. But I'm not allowed to go in anymore because of my views of trans kids. And mm -hmm. also, I don't pull punches. Like, I don't have victim categories. So if I'm going to make fun of, you know, white people, which I do all the time, you know, Canadians, the Danes, Americans, you know, Starbucks, all girls named Brittany, uh, rednecks, I make fun of everybody. I'm not going to not make fun of black people, Jewish people, Muslim people. Like, I, right. I don't have sacred cows. You're an equal opportunity slave owner. I remember I that. I am. Thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh and so uh i i had those wins but then when COVID hit they all couldn't tour and i felt great like i'd set up all these uh <laughs> i fed i set up all these systems that they that you know and i'm like yeah look at you guys and now it's opening back up again and now they're doing funnier jokes which i deeply i should be happy about that which i am mm -hmm. but the whisper is like I did that fucking joke eight years ago. And why uh, yeah. tells me? Yeah, yeah. You don't listen then, to oh, I know. And it's like, <laughs> I had 2 million views on YouTube on that one joke. And then they had to fucking delete the YouTube. Man. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's like a voice and it's not real. So I'm happy that they are capable of doing more uh, jokes that are actually funny and that they can do theaters again and everything's open, but they're still on a leash. And that's why I recommend comedians. You know, right now, the leash, they let out the leash. It's like opening up a pasture and then they close gates and they pull you back in. And so if you really want to be free, you have to start setting up your own shit because they're not going to kill you. You know, if they were going to kill someone, they would have killed me. You know, it's like mm -hmm. when, when all these truthers uh, do their spook stories of like, you know, the CIA and Mossad, they're going to come kill you if you're tr uh, say the truth. Bullshit. They might they just won't let you be on Airbnb or some shit. It's just annoying. <laughs> And so, and so if you want to actually be free, you can't be in their pipeline because they can, and they have every right to do what I'm explaining. This is why I'm still great, grateful. As someone who's setting up my own networks and my own everything, to have that network that they set up, this pyramid, you know, the, the theaters and the clubs and all of it, 
you know, you got to do what they say or else they're not going to let you in what they built. And so if you want to be free, you have to build your own shit. So anyway, the question about um, is it opening up? Yeah, I think that there's enough competitors in the world, Saudi Arabia, Russia, China, you know, like all these other places. And because of the Internet, the branding of America, home of the free, has to have more freedom in it. And a lot of people are not into this woke shit. Mm-hmm. Because I was doing tweets where I was like, man, I, I, I really want to tour in Saudi Arabia so that I can be free to do comedy. <laughs> and, people, and it was breaking people's programming. They're just like, what the fuck? No, you, you sure? And I'm like, no, no. You can't do my jokes in America, but I can do them in Saudi Arabia. And they're just like, but you sure? And I'm like, dude, it's true. I've been asked to do shows in Saudi Arabia. Like a bunch of Muslims think I'm fucking hilarious. <laughs> because it, over there, Russia, you get to make fun of all this shit. You know, a guy dresses up as a girl, that's on the table. In America, you're seen as, like, evil if you make fun of, like, a guy who chops his dick off. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, if you're going to want to get that branding back, and my theory long term is that they want to fight another war, and they lost all the guys. You know, like, all the guys that would fight wars, like me and all my friends, well, I wouldn't personally because I just think war is fucked up. But my demographic is the warrior demographic. So uh, and nobody wants to anymore. Everybody's like gardening. I mean, I know Navy SEALs and, and special ops guys that literally are just like asking me how to grow tomatoes. Like they don't want to fight mm-hmm. these wars because the branding is gone now. It's like mm-hmm. you go out there and you fight so that you can come home and cut up a little kid's dick. It's like. You can't do that. Like, like what are you are fighting gone. for? Yeah, what are you, what are you fighting for? for? Exactly, the purpose. And uh, and so because of that, they're opening it back up to masculinity. Like, you have to be able to make fun of weakness. You have to be able to make fun of indulgent men, the quote-unquote soy boy, you know, or else you have no warriors. Your, your, your armed forces are literally like, it's like the IRS. It's like, how are you going to fight a war? And if you actually need, because the American system requires – our military. That's how this is valuable. If you don't use this, you get killed. So that's the gang. And now all the men are like, you know, we, we're not, we're not feeling it anymore. And so they're like, yeah, you can make fun of, you can make fun of rollerblading. And they're like, yeah. And so, <laughs> and so that's why I think it's opening up again. Cause the powers that be the, the, the farmers of man are starting to be like, man, our, uh, our males are starting to get pretty weak. You know, and then how do you fight a war? And so, yeah, because you need hyper masculinity to have someone go 10,000 miles away and shoot someone in the head that they've never met because of the banking industry. Like, that's a crazy ask. So to get that, you need a male culture that's hyper aggressive. They they don't like weakness. They're they're like aggressive. You can't have this like male, female blending into nonsense shit or else no one's going to fight your wars. And so. And now that you have legitimate competitors, Saudi Arabia is, a, I mean, they just bought the PGA. I'm going to go out on a limb and say they're not going to be waving the rainbow flag on the ninth hole anymore. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so the more they buy industry in China, it's like they'll take black people off movie posters. Yeah. <laughs> like they're like, what, why, why are you guys doing this? And so, and so uh, I think that that's really causing a shift. And also people like me that showed we could just make our own and we don't need them is very terrifying for a controlling narcissistic personality. Yeah. And, uh, and that's why it's cool that like, let's say me and you disagree on NAS or something. It doesn't matter because we're not narcissists. It's like the, the, the narcissistic personality is like, unless we agree on everything, I, 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 I like seethe because you exist, you know? Yeah. Where in reality, it's like, what are your behaviors? What are your values? You know, that type of shit. And so that's why I think uh, we're winning in a lot of ways because so many people are getting that. You know, so many of my audience are black or Jewish or whatever. And and the and the uh, the narratives are just crumbling like a ton of Jews will come to my channel because they think it's the funniest channel because I understand them the most when I make fun of them. And then people are like, Oh, but he's anti-Semitic. And they're like, no, he's just against showing kids porn. Like, yeah. like do you not see the difference? You know? And so that's why I, I'm very excited about it. And decentralized, I'm getting more views now than I did on YouTube. And that's why their little uh their little stranglehold is like a joke at this point. It's almost like uh the 
the cool kids in school that won't let you sit at their table. And over time, they're just a bunch of no one wants to sit at their table anymore. Yeah, I think you're right. I think things <laughs> are changing. Uh, I don't know. I don't know if I have opinions on why they're changing, but I do think we're going to be entering. I think people are desperate. They're hungry for uh, truth. <laughs> Starved, yeah, in definitely, fact. Definitely. And, definitely. and so, I don't know. I feel pretty. People say, oh, are you blackpilled? I was like, well, I'm white pill, but I had to become black pilled first. You know, I'm a, a little of both, it, yeah. right? You know? Yeah. Um, so, can we leave with something? I want to ask you, uh, can you give me your top three or four things that you would tell your younger self or tell maybe someone who's listening about how you can improve your life? I know you're not a self-help guru. No, I do. I'm I don't, very I, I unintentionally do self-help. Yeah. I mean, I have like bins and bins and bins with thousands of like handwritten letters about how I've helped people's lives. And that was not my intention, but I just think like, showing people what I'm going through and not having that filter has been very helpful for a lot of people. And so, yeah, I actually can give advice. Like normally I would feel embarrassed by that. And I wouldn't have like self-help advice. Cause I'm like, who the fuck am I? I'm like an idiot. And bear in mind, I also don't know why these things are happening. Like you, you answered the question better than I did in the sense where you said, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know either. I just have, I just have opinions that I just sound very confident. I mean, I'm right a lot. Mm -hmm. But I could be completely wrong. It could be for completely different reasons. But anyway, what I would tell people is family's wealth, money's debt, you know, to reframe your paradigm of like um, a hill to grow on, not a hill to die on. You know, persistence is fertile, not resistance is futile. Like I'm a big word guy. I like to flip mm -hmm. things around. And so to really start looking at the gratitude where it's like, where it's like when you ask, what would I tell my younger self? I wouldn't say shit because I don't want to affect anything that brought me here, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's that's a good way to think where it's like even all those horrible mistakes, like taking the black pill to get to the white pill or like all the things I did that looking back are insane or idiotic. If I didn't do that, would I have met my wife? Would I have seen what I saw? Would I have grown the way I did? And so I actually wouldn't affect my timeline in any way. What I would tell young people is be excited about productivity. And for every negative you hear is an opportunity. And how um, the Chinese word for chaos is the same word for opportunity. So whenever people are saying, because you're hearing a lot of like uh, prison of nostalgia talk about how it used to be so great. Now everything's going to shit. You hear that all the time now. It's not. The, the realm is perfect. It's made the way it's supposed to be made. Everything is in balance. And, for, and every time the snake squeezes, it has to release somewhere else and just keep looking for those releases. For example, um, if you now see that something's corrupted or you see that uh, something is not what you thought it was, you're just now freed to not go down that path. Like, let's say you're like, oh, the government's corrupt. Well, now you don't have to work for the government. Like that, that, that path has been shown to be bad. Now, what's a good path? And then when you start seeing, okay, here's one for it for you scarcity is the biggest spell so th the idea of scarcity the club of rome shit the what's a, the malthusian belief that there's a there's a limited amount of stuff in the world and um and we have to lower the population control the population make everyone gay and depressed because <laughs> because we need to keep our stuff and they became the nazis and the nazis became the woke and it's all the same idea the idea is we have to control um, we have to control everybody and everything and keep the population low because there's not enough stuff. That's mm -hmm. a lie. If you start farming, you realize that where you have dirt, water, and sunshine, you have unlimited uh, everything. And in my last magazine, I wrote an article called The Unlimited Tomato, where I show one tomato. So one, one packet of seeds can grow a tomato plant. Each tomato plant has a thousand seeds. Each seed can then become a thousand. And then you can extrapolate where it's literally unlimited food from one little packet. And then you say, yeah, but how can I do that? Dirt in the sun and water. Yeah. And so if you understand that, you understand that your consciousness and your existence is the value of this realm. So let's say, oh, there's not enough iron in the world to pay off the debt. There's not enough commodities. You take one brick of iron, you can buy it for $100. 
You make spoons out of it. It's now worth a thousand. You make little springs for watches. It's worth a million. You know, it's like your labor and your consciousness is what adds value to the material realm. And this material realm is fueled and operated by the spiritual realm. And so what, and then you see that everything's good and fair and like a kind father, all of our mistakes were leading us back to the path. And then once you're on that, in that mindset, there really is like no limit to anything, you know, because the irony is, is the whole Luciferian thing of be free, do whatever you want. You know, they're oppressing you. That's the road to no options. Like you will be a slave. You know, St. Augustine said a man is a slave to his vices. Yes. So like a king is a slave and a slave is a king, depending on what your addictions are. So if you understand that everything around you becomes like fruit. And that's why people look at my life and sometimes they're like, man, you sound, you sound kind of crazy, but everything around you is so fucking beautiful. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I've always <laughs> happy, happy children. My wife is thriving. She's like always happy, always. And don't get me wrong. There's, it's not constant happiness. But if you just look at my life and you're like, that's like dreamy as fuck. And it is like we have all these. We just pick fruit off trees and work the land and I just speak my mind and people send me gold. It's fucking hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it, it's, but it's because of that original thing that you're not the parasite on the earth. The earth is a unlimited material realm for your consciousness to grow. As long as you're in service of other, love thy neighbor, love thy creator. Everything else is gravy. My- and once you see that, it really is like you live in heaven. Yeah. And so you will get those voices of like, yeah, but they stole. Yeah, but fucking people aren't aren't aware, of you know. But that's just that's just a little voice. He becomes kind of funny. You know, when when the when the Satan is your subconscious, it's terrifying cuz you you think it's you. But over time you realize it's just like a funny little demon guy who's just like, "Oh, it might be nice." <laughs> 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 the more that you come to observe it, you made me think of two things. There was another book I read around the same time I read The Power Now. Eckhart Tolle also talked about that voice. I can't remember how he talked about it, but he discussed. I got to read Eckhart Tolle. I always, I, yeah. I always had a revulsion to him for some reason, but everything you're saying about him sounds great. Well, I only read The Power Now, and I definitely would say it's worth the read. I should go back and look at it. You, I will you know, read it now. years later. But there was another book that um, I forget who wrote it. It was called The Untethered Soul. And it was, I thought, I read it and I was like, oh, this is basically a, a short, condensed version of the power of now, of the other book. But he called it The Roommate. He was like, that negative voice. If you start yeah. to, for anybody that's having trouble with that, if you have a negative voice, it's, putting you down in your head or whatever he's like you think of it like an actual roommate and you would kick that person out of your house you'd be like you can't live here anymore because you're always saying negative crap to me and that helps you kind of distance yourself from that that negative like that's not me you know um but the other thing and and other people should and people should know that it affects everyone like the people that have that voice the worst that i've ever known are high level special forces men so like if right now you're sitting and you're like, yeah, why am I so hard on myself? Those guys, some of them, like some of my best friends have had to go through extremes. That's why they, you know, they've gotten into more like psychedelics and they've done all kinds of stuff to get that voice to calm down. Because when you're like doing these extreme missions, you're that hard on yourself to be like a highly, highly performing male, that voice gets nuts wow. where they're like harder, faster, shoot harder, you know, kill, kill, like. You know, and it's not like it's it's an evil voice. It's not like a voice getting them to hurt people. That's why people shouldn't be afraid of vets. It's like it's like hard on them. It's like always hammering at them to do more. And those are the people I've known that have been the most affected by that. So so just know you're not alone with that voice. And a lot of the guys that are like the most shredded and the most accomplished and have all these awards, that that voice is on their back, just like more. You, you're yeah. nothing. You have to show these people that. You know, and so, you know, it's something to really control. Yeah. Like you said, it's not that the ego itself is bad. It has a purpose. It's just when you sort of let it in the driver's seat. Exactly. Yeah. um, The other thing you made me think of, I'm going to look this up after the fact and send it to you. Uh, My pastor, uh, Bradley Helgerson, I think you'll like him. He, He has a sermon about how God created man to be a gardener and to be a cultivator. Yeah. Culture. And I had never really thought about it that way, but that's everything you're talking about. 
kind That's of exactly thing. it. I mean, if you're in a rural environment, the, the Christian pastor stuff is like perfect. He's like, the Bible is so agrarian. And that's why one reason I think Christianity has gotten hijacked with the, like the mega churches and all this stuff is they'll get in these huge fights and so pompous when I think they're, I, I mean, I don't know personally, you know, I'm not going to be arrogant at all about that, but they're missing some of the most subtle and obvious like farm references that, you know, the whole like pick up your cross, toil in the field, all that stuff. A lot of it has to do with like our, our cultivating, our cultivating in our animal husbandry, you know, like the lost sheep of Israel and all that. And like how you tend your flock is how you tend your family. It's how you tend your nation. And it's all a fractal. And so if you have a pastor that's referencing culture and cultivation, then you have a good pastor because that's, that's a huge amount of the Bible and about Christianity has to do with, you know, how a, it doesn't have to be rural, but how you like live your life in accordance to being productive, you know? And so crafting, even, even uh, being a comedian and being a musician, like, yeah, yeah, exactly. The act of cultivating, of taking something like you said, you add value by your labor, your creativity, and you're cultivating something, even if it's not an actual garden. Um, Yeah. 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 The garden's a fractal metaphor. It's like, It's like, and that's why you can apply it to being an accountant. You can apply it to how you tend your sheep when you're doing paperwork or do, you're doing anything, you know? And, and yeah, creating culture, like as a cheese maker now, like my wife makes a lot of cheese and I milk the cows and we cream them. And all. The culture of the cheese is what makes the cheese. So you can take it and if you burn the culture, you know, if you pasteurize it or if you homogenize the culture, like you want to make everybody a Starbucks corporate entity. I'm, I watch it all the time. If you want a bunch of different cheeses, then you can't have that corporate, that, that corpocracy that's trying to make everyone talk the same and everyone look the same and act the same. And our diversity is our skin color, but mm-hmm. we all have to be the same person. Like that's, yes. that's cheese making. That's how you make this bland burnt shit cheese. <laughs> and so that's why I'm it, the irony about being called racist is I'm really into other cultures nations right like i want them all to exist like i i want you know i was raised in a very uh american indian part of the country i want the algonquins to remember who they are and the iroquois and have and have like the japanese like remember their calligraphy and their origami and all this stuff and i think that one of the great uh tragedies of america is the homogenization of a lot of black culture that there was a lot more to it and like the bayou versus the Mississippi Delta versus these areas where they had like the strong culture. And then it just became, you know, Cardi B and bullshit. And then you're, you're called crazy for pointing that out or you're, or you're the one full of hate because you point out that like, that isn't a culture. That's like hell. Corporations. Like yeah. And, it's a, it's yeah. a corporate is, is yeah. used to say to me, uh, he was like, you know, yay said to me once he goes, uh, yeah, I just watched, uh, what kind of, what was that? What was that called? It was a uh, black Panther. He goes, I took my daughters to see black Panther. He goes, that's the, the Jewish version of black people. <laughs> 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 and he was right. And then, and then you'll be called anti-Semitic for pointing that out where you have like actual black culture. And then you have like the, how the, the better word would be Hollywood, but it's funnier to say Jewish, but like the Hollywood version of what African culture is. And that it's like the Disney world version, the, the the McDonald's version of food, the Taco Bell version of Mexicans. It's like, it's just so fucking gross to me. And that's why I I encourage people to grow their culture and don't be defined on what you don't like, unless it's not people. Like a corporation means corpus oration, the voice of the dead. So when I'm making fun of that, I'm not making fun of the people. Like McDonald's isn't a person, you know. Uh, Beyonce is owned by the same people. Like Beyonce is a brand that's owned by the same holding company that owns Panera Bread. You know what the holding company is called? What? Jab. Jab Holdings. Not <laughs> kidding. Yeah. And they did all the, and they had all the Krispy Kreme. Remember they were doing all the promotions for the, uh, for the yeah, for the jab. Yeah. So, and so they also, they own Beyonce as a brand. They own David Beckham. And the family that owns Jab is a like old, you know, Nazi German family. 
Like they didn't lose it. Uh, that's a whole different conversation. One okay. <laughs> I've got a lot of things to research. I'm going to let you go. <laughs> oh, and I know right, you've cool. got a full family life there to get back to. Um, just tell people one more time where they can find you and I'll make sure all these links are below. So you guys check out uh, the description below. I can ramble. I mean, I could, How I, could I? could, yeah, I could just great. start talking about anything. All right. So um, my streaming platform that we control, that we have our own servers, all that it's five bucks a month. And that pays for the, all the back side of it is unauthorized.tv. And then I'm uh, rumble. I'm Owen Benjamin on rumble. I'm on odyssey. I'm on telegram t.me slash own Benjamin comedy. There's some Indian guy pretending to be me to sell crypto. So watch out for that guy. And then I'm on, um, we have our own social media that you can get uh, wherever you get your apps. So that would be Bertaria times okay. in the app store. And then we're also uh, have our own magazine. So Bertaria times.com. And if you want to go to the um, uh, events we do, it's Bertaria times events. And uh, yeah, unbearablesmedia.com for all of the bear creations. Like all my listeners make stuff. A lot of them are funnier than I am. So <laughs> cartoons, music, all kinds of shit. Uh, that's at unbearablesmedia.com. Cool. Thank you so much. It's Thank you. Thanks for having me. I love Cheers. talking to you. Take care. Peace.